Did you know that the U.S. Department of Defense has adapted the same Islam-friendly, non-critical analysis of Islam used by the elite academic Muslim scholars in our universities? In other words, they want to polish the image of Islam, sanitize the image of Islam. But in reality, this is not the way Islam is seen in the rest of the world, including the Muslim world. Today we are going to continue with this censorship, um, uh, basically, stance that is taken uh, not just in the field of academia, but believe it or not, into other fields as well. So Dr. J, thank you again for highlighting, putting the spotlight on, um, uh, you know, uh, Wilford Smith and uh, how that uh, played out into uh, his own academic career at McGill and then later in Harvard. Now, you mentioned something to me that was really a little bit shocking, that this censorship actually uh, migrated to other fields as well. Yeah, it did uh, migrate, and that's where we're going to go to next. So starting in academia, it also had an impact on other areas, such as the U.S. Defense Department. Let me just uh, quote what Shoemaker says on page 7. He said, after the Second World War and during the Cold War, the U.S. Depart uh, Defense Department, coupled with powerful corporate interests, needed information on how to navigate global politics and advance U.S. policy goals. So they needed to produce knowledge about Islam in its contemporary form to be politically useful, resulting in curtailing any studies of Islam's origins, any critical studies of Islam's origins. Politically correct, it, basically. Basically, it became, had to be completely correct in order, and for obvious reasons. They had to have relationship with these powers that were now freed up uh, the, after the Second World War. The colonial powers then gave back their colonies. Remember, 95% of the Muslim world was colonized by the different European powers, not by the United States, but by the European powers. Following the Second World War in the 1950s, and particularly in the 1960s then, they pulled out of their colonies, and those all became independent nations. Now, how do you have relationship with those independent nations? Well, in order to do so, you're going to have to appease them, come alongside them. You're going to have to have contracts with them. You're going to have to have business interests, especially with the oil-rich countries, because this is where oil was being discovered. Everybody needed oil, and so therefore you're going to have to have a whole department, uh, defense department, that now had to retool and completely change. And in order to uh, uh, accommodate them, both financially and also politically, and certainly in, uh, in your defense initiatives, you're going to make sure that you're not going to say anything critical, certainly not on the origins of Islam, which is the one critical area that was starting to come to the fore. And so that's why they shut down any critical analysis of historical criticism. Mm -hmm. Hughes, uh, in his book in 2008, says this, Thus, a certain version of Islam was privileged at the expense of its other cultural expressions in a flattening that sought to make the information more universally relevant for policymakers and industry. So they purposely flattened, they purposely said anything that's critical of Islam, we will not, for, we will not uh, uh, give money to, we will not uh, project, and we certainly will not use. And so all the departments, both politically and in the defense departments, therefore, changed their policies on Islam to be benevolent and benign. So that introduced, that in, 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 uh, infected our political and our uh, uh, financial departments. Now let's move in to the elite and let's go to the next group. The next group that, that came to play then were the academics, the Muslim academics. Now, uh, what uh, Shoemaker says is these academic Muslims uh, are defined as believers mostly from the upper class. They are come from pri privileged backgrounds who are more highly educated than most Muslims. When you look here in the United States, and you notice this and I notice this, whenever I did a study uh, back when I was doing my master's degree back in the 19, my goodness, that's a long time ago, 1990s. 1980s, sorry, 1980s when I was doing my master's degree on why uh, Americans became Muslims, why they converted to Islam. I noticed immediately when I went from mosque to mosque to mosque all over the East Coast, I went to all the major cities, and I noticed that the mosques in the inner cities were all Afro-American mosques, but those outside the cities were all Indian and Pakistani and Bangladeshi mostly, mm -hmm. and f Middle Eastern mosques, and neither the twain met. And it was these outside the cities in the rural areas that were very expensive. They were very highly educated. Many of them were immigrants that came from these countries. They came here to work. They had great degrees. 
they were the ones that started imposing this high this criticism of anything critical of Islam, especially historical criticism. And this is what Hughes goes on and state uh, uh, carries on and speaks about this group of Muslims. They are elite and they tend to be very highly educated. They are the ones that are actually in our universities. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that are defining Islam and trying to sanitize it for a Western mindset. And he says this, speaking from their lofty perches in the ivory tower of academia, these Muslim scholars, quote unquote, will frequently insist, for instance, that Islam in its true form is fully compatible with most of the liberal values of the, West, of the Western Academy on issues such as race, gender, and especially violence. This came to the fore practically after 9-11. And Hughes brings this up. He's writing in 2014, just at the height of where ISIS is coming to the fore. With Al-Qaeda doing what it did on the, around the world, with Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, all these other groups popping up all over the world. And then, of course, with ISIS coming to the fore in 2014, suddenly Islam had to have a whole new, whole new narrative. And I saw this, I've said this to you, at Speaker's Corner. In the 1990s, at Speaker's Corner, when I started in 1992, we used to get beat up. There was violence. we get punched. I got broken glasses. You can see where they try to open up my throat. There was no, there was no push to be peaceful in my interactions with Muslims. Muslims use violence quite readily. Until 9-11, until 2021, September 11, 2021, almost overnight the narrative changed to one of peace. Now they became a religion of peace. And I, because I saw it personally firsthand there at Speaker's Corner. It became a lot easier to get up on the ladder and actually confront Muslims because I knew I wouldn't get beat up anymore. But that was a narrative that was imposed because of what happened on the world stage. Right. What Hughes is saying is this happened especially in academia as well. Now the academics, the Muslims, the, these Muslims who are academic, they are from Muslim countries. They're not living in the United States. They're in our academic institutions. They are now trying to push this new narrative of peace. In order to do that, of course, uh, they, they, are, they are very clear that they don't want anybody critiquing Islam and bringing up all these violent verses. You know, there's a whole litany of violent verses. Chapter 9, uh, verse 5. Chapter 9, verse 29. Chapter 8, verse 39. Chapter 47, verse 4. I mean, the list can go on and on. I think you have about 160 of these verses that are all violent in the Quran. So what do you do? You just shut down any uh, research on that. But then you've also got to make sure that you don't have any research on who was the one that created or how this book was put together or what was the environment uh, where the creation was. So that was the academic Muslims. Shoemaker says... And ask this question. However, these academics, these very small group, there's only a small group of them, do they represent Muslims? When he says, when you look at global Islam beyond the universities, it is much more diverse on these issues, and its adherents do not understand their faith as being at all compatible with these Western values. So you have this elite group, and remember, yeah, Al Qadi, I mean, um, not Al Qadi, uh, yes, um, what's his name? Um, Yes, Al Qadi. Yes, Al Qadi. What did I say? Al Qadi. Yes, Al Qadi. In yeah. that interview, that infamous interview in 2020, With the when he was hijab. turning to Muhammad Shabat uh, hijab. hijab, and he said to Muhammad Hijab, "You in the East?" He said, "East versus West." Correct. He's talking. He is one of these academics that I'm talking about. He is from Pakistan. His family is from Pakistan. He's living in Houston. He got his doctorate at Yale University. He is probably probably the most well-known ac Muslim academic living in the Muslim uh, in the West who is, speaks, and when he speaks, hundreds, millions listen. And he said to Muhammad Hijab, you are in the East, I live in the West. You, uh, uh, your standard narrative, which is the Islamic narrative, has holes in it, he said. But we in the West here, they've they, in the last hundred years, they've come by leaps and bounds. And they're looking at us Muslims like the emperor with no clothes. Remember that when he said that in yeah. that interview? Yeah. That's what he's talking about. We in the West, we have a different genre. We have a whole different environment that we have to live in. We have to live in this much more politically correct. We have to sanitize it. We have to ameliorate it so that it fits in the Western model of peace and reconciliation. Islam has to be peaceful and reconciled to the rest of the world. You, however, don't have the problems that we have. That can became very clear in that interview. Well, that's exactly what Hughes is saying here, and that's what Shoemaker is saying. However, that's only in the Western world. What about the rest of the world? What about the 99% who don't live in the West? What about those Muslims? Right. Why is it we're not speaking for them? 
Exactly, exactly. So when we we want to wrap it up uh, because I want you to uh, hold your thoughts for the next episode. What would we uh, be exposing next time? Well, obviously, because of all this push by the Muslims and by the U.S. Department and also by William Cantrell Smith, because of this push to sanitize it, to ameliorate it, to make sure Islam is not has no critical analysis, what has Western academia done? I'm going to go and show you what they have done. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.